blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed be God's kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, Heavenly King, Almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. Receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One. You alone are the Lord. You alone are the Most High. Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O God, who on the holy mount revealed the chosen witnesses, your well-beloved Son, wonderfully transfigured in radiant white and glistening, mercifully grant that we, being delivered from the disquietude of this world, may by faith behold the King in his beauty, who with you, O Father, and you, O Holy Spirit, lives and reigns, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated for the first reading. Exodus. Moses came down from Mount Sinai. As he came down from the mountain with the two tablets of the covenant in his hand, Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone because he had been talking with God. When Aaron and all the Israelites saw Moses, the skin of his face was shining, and they were afraid to come near him. But Moses called to them, and Aaron and all the leaders of the congregation returned to him and Moses spoke with them. Afterward, all the Israelites came near, and he gave them in commandment all that the Lord had spoken with him on Mount Sinai. When Moses had finished speaking with them, he put a veil on his face. But whenever Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he would take the veil off until he came out. And when he came out and told the Israelites what he had been commanded, the Israelites would see the face of Moses that the skin of his face was shining, and Moses would put the veil on his face again until he went in to speak with him. The word of the Lord. Thanks. Thanks be to God. Let's read Psalm 99 responsively, breaking at the asterisk. The Lord is king, let the people tremble. The Lord is great in Zion. He is high above all peoples. Let them confess his name, which is great and awesome. He is the Holy One, Almighty. Almighty King, lover of justice, you have established equity. You have executed justice, righteousness, and Proclaim the greatness of the Lord our God and fall down before his footstool. He is the Holy One. Moses and Aaron among his priests, and Samuel among those who call upon his name. They call upon the Lord, and he answered them. He spoke to them out of the pillar of cloud. They kept his testimonies, and he gave them. O Lord our God, you answered them indeed. Proclaim the greatness of the Lord our God and worship him upon his holy hill. For the Lord our God is the Holy One. 
A reading from Second Book of Peter. I think it right, as long as I am in this body, to refresh your memory, since I know that my death will come soon, as indeed our Lord Jesus Christ has made clear to me. And I will make every effort so that after my departure, you may be able at any time to recall these things. For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we had been eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received honor and glory from God the Father when that voice was conveyed to him by the majestic glory, saying, This is my Son, my beloved, with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice come from heaven while we were with him on the holy mountain. So we have the prophetic message more fully confirmed. You will do well to be attentive to this as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. First of all, you must understand this, that no prophecy of scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation because no prophecy ever came by human will, but men and women moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. The word of the Lord. Jesus Christ, according to Luke. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Now about eight days after these sayings, Jesus took with him Peter and John and James and went up to the mountain to pray. And while he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly they saw two men, Moses and Elijah, talking to him. They appeared in glory and were speaking of his departure which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now Peter and his companions were weighed down to sleep, but since they had stayed awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. Just as they were leaving him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. While he was saying this, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were terrified as they entered the cloud. Then from the cloud came a voice that said, This is my son, my chosen. Listen to him. When the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone. And they kept silent, and in those days told no one any of the things they had seen. The Gospel of Christ. Praise you, Lord Christ.
May I speak to you in the name of God, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. The story of the Transfiguration, which we just heard, is about much more than just Jesus' Transfiguration itself, although that is, of course, extremely important. In Luke's Gospel, this is one of the big moments showing the leaders or the disciples who Jesus really is. Jesus is transformed in face and appearance and is joined by two others. Many people hearing this passage are confused by the appearance of Moses and Elijah, but you have to understand that in their day, the collected scripture and knowledge of the people of Israel was known as the Law and the Prophets. These two streams were considered what God had revealed to his people. Moses represents the Torah, the Law, and Elijah represents the prophetic tradition. The cloud descending at the end of the passage is directly reminiscent of the exodus narrative with Moses. Thus, in this scene, we have Jesus not only directly connected to what God had already revealed, but also in continuity and fulfillment of it. However, this is not simply just a reveal of who Jesus was. We're also given a prelude for ourselves. And that's what I'd like to focus on today. One of Jesus' constant refrains throughout the Gospels boils down to, I'm doing this now, but then it's your turn. If you follow me, if you're my follower, you'll do what I do. It's no surprise why many have understood the work of the Christian life as the imitation of Christ. Jesus' transfiguration not only revealed his nature to his disciples then, but it also asks us today a vital question. To what extent are we ourselves willing to be transformed as part of our Christian journey? This is not only a deeply complex topic, it's a deeply personal one, one that at times has done a lot of harm. I seek to explore it with you with sensitivity. Since Christianity's early days, there have been those who have wanted to see just how far they can push themselves into being transformed into the image of Christ. They've wanted to see just how close they can come to what they think a transformed life looks like. To this day, this is the core of Eastern Orthodox theology, increasingly achieving oneness with Jesus and decreasing the self within. This desire for transformation has led to many movements, some of which have had a very mixed bag on historical reflection. To name just a few, monasticism, pietism, and puritanism all emerged from this impulse. Don't think I'm existentially criticizing them, merely highlighting that what has come of these movements, like all movements really, is ultimately a mixed legacy. I think the impulse to deeply desire personal transformation is a good one, and certainly a Christian one. Think about the words of St. Paul in Galatians, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. It is a good impulse, and a faithful part of Christianity, but Christians have often taken it to a very negative place. When we start demanding others live according to our understanding of being transformed into the image of Jesus, we not only lose Jesus, but we open the door for all kinds of oppression and tyranny. In the church that I grew up in, people used to joke, but not joke, all sinners are welcome, as long as you stopped your sinning before you showed up here. Ha 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 ha. Having to live according to a set of moral standards placed upon you by others with power can be utterly terrible. Many churches, past and present, have taken the Christian call to be transformed unto Christ and warped it into an abusive demand for submission, conformity, and unquestioning obedience. Many people have found their way to our church because they had such an experience somewhere else and felt that they had to flee. That's a very common reason many end up here in the Episcopal Church. We started somewhere else, but we saw or experienced something we felt like we had to get away from. We wanted to continue as Christians and eventually found our way here. That's a very common Episcopal narrative. However, it also comes with its own danger. We're aware, that the potential, we're aware of the potential of transformation to become problematic. 
So we are sometimes so afraid of potentially being judgmental that we start to cease actually being about anything, anything that could actually affect our life. I'm not saying that's here, but how many of you have been to an Episcopal church that's basically just a social club for bashing evangelicals and Catholics? I know I have. We can easily define ourselves so thoroughly by what we're not that we have no way to define ourselves by what we are. In such a way, for fear of who we don't want to be, we disconnect our faith from its ability to actually have an impact on our lives. Take up your cross and follow me becomes, you're fine the way you are. I have long worried that here in the Episcopal Church, many of us have understood God loves you, no exceptions, to mean, you're great, just keep doing what you're doing. Now, before any of you misunderstand what I'm saying here, let's take a step back. Let's take it entirely out of a religious context. Imagine you went to go see a counselor, a psychologist, or a life coach. Totally secular, has nothing to do with religion or Christianity. It would be nuts to sit down with a professional, comprehensively go over your life with its ups and downs, and expect they're going to go, you know what? You're perfect. Change nothing, ever. You've got this figured out perfectly. Just keep doing exactly what you're doing until you die. I'd like to think there's no one who thinks of themselves like that, but I'm probably wrong. What I hope you take from that is that just as it's ludicrous to assume we've achieved existential perfection in the other aspects of our lives, so likewise we should be open to seeing this in our faith and spiritual lives as well. There is still no one still living who is without room and need to further step into the imitation of Christ. In all the other arenas and understandings of life, we generally seem to understand there's stuff we can still work on. So I'd like to encourage you to take that openness and at least consider it in your life of faith. This isn't something I'm externally demanding of you, telling you things you have to do or not do. No, I'm saying for you to look within and reflect yourself. Ask God to be with you in that introspection. Ask the Holy Spirit to help you take stock. How might God be calling you to work on being transformed through pursuit of Christ? Think of our Old Testament reading. The narrative is that after Moses meets God, his face glowed afterwards. It could even blind people to where they felt they needed to veil his face. This is the actual reason, if you look at classical art of Moses, he's depicted with horns. It was from the light showing off of his face. Now, whether or not you want to engage with that story as history or metaphor, the meaning stays the same. In drawing close to God, we are changed and marked. Somehow, in drawing towards the one that transforms, we ourselves are also transformed. This is actually one of the biggest themes of the New Testament. Another helpful word is renew. Keep those in mind, transformation, and renewal. Think of Romans 12.2. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds, so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. In the vision of John of Patmos, commonly called the Book of Revelation, we're given a powerful image of this transformation and renewal of God. See, the home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them as their God, they will be his peoples, and God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more, for the first things have passed away. And the one who was seated on the throne said, See, I am making all things new. God is making all things new, and we too get to be a part of that. We're included in that. That should excite us, rather than worry us. I'm encouraging you to seek transformation and renewal in your life. I'm not telling you to seek that in the lives of others. What I'm not telling you to do is go, yes, yes, you're right. You need to seek openness to ways for God to transform my life through seeking conformity with Jesus. Yes, got it. Then turning to your neighbor and going, you know what you really need to do is blah, blah, blah. That's not what I'm saying. <laughs> Transformation is a vital part of Christianity. 
but seeking to impose transformation on others is tyrannical hypocrisy. I seem to recall Jesus saying something about that, something about a speck in your neighbor's eye and the log in your own. I seem, seem to recall something along those lines. We're called to transform, but keep it focused on yourself. How do you feel called in further imitation of Christ? Listen to Paul's description of discernment in our epistle reading. You will do well to be attentive to this as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. You are already a light shining in a dark place. Where is the morning star of Jesus rising in your hearts? This week, consider Jesus' call to transformation in your own lives. This is the work of each of us, but if it's something we each consider in our own lives, I can't even imagine what God might do in our midst. And that's very exciting. Amen. Father, we pray for your holy Catholic Church. That we may all be one. Grant that every member of the Church may truly and humbly serve you. That they may be glorified by all people. We pray for all bishops, priests, and deacons. That they may be faithful ministers of your words and sacraments. We pray for all who govern and hold authority in the nations of the world. Give us grace to do your will in all that we undertake. That our works may find favor in your sight. Have compassion on those who suffer from any grief or trouble. That they may be delivered from their distress. Give to the departed eternal rest. Let the light of protection shine upon them. We praise you for your saints who have entered into joy. May we also come to share in you. Let us pray for our own needs and those of others.
let your continual mercy, O Lord, cleanse and defend your church. And because it cannot continue in safety without your help, protect and govern it always by your goodness, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy upon you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Thanksgiving celebrations of life. I'll real, real quick before I get to Andrea, thank you as always. Um, I was going to say, Helen from the 8 o'clock service this week is helping to coordinate. There's a fundraiser for local schools called Fill Out the Bus going on. It's today through Wednesday and it's 10 o'clock until 4. So there's apparently a bus parked outside Staples and they're asking people to buy some school supplies and drop them off in the bus. So if anyone feels called to pick up some school supplies at Staples or anywhere else and drop them off in the bus, they're filling that up today through Wednesday, 10 to 4. I want to thank Diane and John and Denise for doing coffee hour today. And please, everyone, stay because we're celebrating Rule's birthday. Well, I'm just going to give thanks uh, for a successful summer at Ascension School with uh, I think four camps, maybe five camps, I can't remember for sure, but a number of children from St. Paul's um, Parish Connection 
uh, have gone this summer, and we're just grateful for your support of uh, bringing in bottles and cans for their scholarship assistance, and for the kids that went to camp. Um, I don't know, but I hope they all had a really, really good time. There is one more camp coming up. It's the end of August, the last weekend in August, and it's the adult ed. It's now called Faith Formation. It's for adults, and the subject this year is eternal life. So there's still room and time for you to sign up. Uh, there is uh, financial help available through St. Paul's, and I'm going, I think Julie is going, and uh, who else, another person? I'm drawing a blank. Huh? Anyway, there would be transportation, I think, for you if you wanted to go. Keep that in mind. Thank you. Other announcements, Thanksgivings, celebrations? Oh, yes, PK, your, your event. Yes, I just want to remind everybody that today is the day of the wine tour. We'll be leading the church here about 11.30 or thereabouts after the coffee hour. We'll meet out front, and if you want to carpool, fine. So, come join us. I almost forgot, our first grandchild, Kathleen Ann Burns, was 24 on the 3rd of August. And Monday, she starts medical school at OHSU. It's a huge, big achievement, and we love her dearly. Pray for her success. Thank you. And I myself am thankful that after being in California for a three-week business trip, my wife and daughter came back late last night. I was supposed to pick them up at Portland at 8 o'clock. It ended up closer being to like 10, 30, 11. So got to get back late at night and turn it right around to be back here with you all. But I'm very grateful they made it back safely. Will you pray with me? Lord God, thank you for the life of our church. Thank you for fun events like wine tasting and school supplies. Thank you for members connected to us and people we love getting into med school, bringing home safe, all the wonderful work of your church, and the continuous learning like what's going on in Ascension School. Thank you for all the things in the life of your community, and thank you for the blessing of everyone gathered here and all the people they know. We lift them up and we thank you for your involvement in our life, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. Let us with gladness present the offerings and oblations of our life and labor to the Lord.
sent him to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary, to be the Savior and Redeemer of the world. In him you have delivered us from evil and made us worthy to stand before you. In him you have brought us out of error into truth, out of sin into righteousness, out of life into death. On the night before he died for us, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, according to his command, O Father, we remember his death, we proclaim his resurrection, we await his coming in glory, and we offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, O Lord of all, presenting to you from your creation this bread and this wine. We pray to you, gracious God, to send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the sacrament of the body of Christ and his blood of the new covenant. Unite us to your Son and his sacrifice, that we may be acceptable through him, being sanctified by the Holy Spirit, in the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under your Christ, and bring us to the heavenly country where with all your saints we may enter the everlasting heritage of your sons and daughters, through Jesus Christ our Lord, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church, and the author of our salvation. By him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. As our Savior Christ has taught us, we now pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. The gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, we thank you for feeding us the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and for assuring us in these holy mysteries that we are living members of the body of your Son and heirs of your eternal kingdom. And now, Father, send us out to do the work you have given us to do, to love and serve you as faithful witnesses of Christ our Lord. To him, to you, and to the Holy Spirit, be honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. The blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, be upon you and remain with you forever. Amen. Amen.
when I used to pull, because I used to pull the mic rather than his mic while he was preaching, which Alan knew about. Hmm. But when he went back to his mic, I cut back on the resonance of his voice, so it was more like a pulpit mic. Right? And we'll see if that turned out. Hmm. No promise. Yeah. Yeah.